At this moment, we are going to welcome our guest, uh, second guest speaker. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, you will love her. She's a very a wonderful uh, lady. She is a person of Dr. Eva Vera Tetefio. She's a medical doctor who believes that patient care should be a physician's first priority. She's currently, uh, she currently has a great interest in maternal, newborn, and child health with the aid of improving maternal and uh, child health before conception and during the prenatal period. Every child deserves to have a healthy, care, a healthy start in life, and every mother should have access to quality health care during pregnancy and child she holds a medical degree from the Accra College of Medicine, one of Ghana's leading private medical school, and an alumnus of KNUST, Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology, Wesley Girls High School, and St. Martin de Poster. Her hobbies are as follows. She loves sports, reading, writing, music, watching movies, and traveling. And one thing I love about her, that she, she's a very football uh, lover. I mean, her, her, her team is uh, Chelsea Football Club. So ladies and gentlemen, let's welcome Dr. Eva Vera Tetefio. Thank you, Dr. Eva Vera, you're welcome. I want to, um, Anyone has got questions that they would want to ask regarding what you shared, they can bring it up for me to be able to answer the questions for them. Okay, so I have a couple of questions here. The first one is, uh, what is the difference between fibroid and endometriosis? That's the first question. Okay. I don't know if I should read or, or you will be No, I'll take us. them block by block so that people don't get lost. Okay. Okay. So with fibroids, it's a benign tumor that grows either in the uterus or out of the uterus. So like phase by least, when it's within the uterus, basically, and we can have some at the cervix. And when it's at the cervix, it usually protrudes out as probably one of the survivors, a polyp or something. But when it's in the uterus, it could be um, in the endometrium, usually. That's where we find it or it can invade the wall. So either um, submucosa, like she told us, or sometimes it can even go outside the uterus and then we can have subserosa, sub or you find some of them in the omentum. So that's what fibroid is. With um, endometriosis, it's the endometrial lining of the uterus. There's just like how we have ectopic pregnancy. We have um, ectopic locations of the um, endometrial lining of the uterus. So when the endometrial lining is found in the uterine wall, the myometrium, that's when we have adenomyosis. Please, we get it. You could sometimes have it lining on, on around the um, bladder. You can have it along the intestine. Some even have it in their chest. There are rare locations of endom um, endometrial tissues. And with these kind of locations, usually what happens is whenever the person is menstruating or you know, in the time of the month because it's cyclical and then the hormones are acting wherever the endometrial lining is found they would have bleeding from all these sides so that's basically the difference between endometriosis and then fibroid and with endometriosis it's like a retrograde um, location of the um, endometrial tissue so sometimes it happens after a pelvic um procedure maybe um hysterectomy or Hysteroscopy story or something, anything that has to do with a pelvic procedure can lead to getting one getting endometriosis. With adenomyosis, um, we really don't know what causes adenomyosis, how the endometrial tissue gets in there. But some postulations say that um 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 you try and um surgeries like DNC, which leads to scraping of the endometrial tissue, could possibly cause an invasion into the myometrium and then you could find the endometrial tissue in the myometrium. So that's the difference between the two. All right, thank you so much, Doc. So the next question is, if I have a fibroid, uh, is it automatically means I won't be able to give birth 
Okay. So, like Faith rightly said, fibroid has the, the different approaches to managing fibroid. It's either conservative or medical. And even with that, we look at symptoms. If it's symptomless, there's no need to worry your head. But if it's giving you symptoms that are threatening your life, or it's affecting your, your general body habitus, then we can go in and then perform a myomectomy or hysterectomy to take out the uterus, depending on how bad the fibroids are scattered in the uterus. Now, one thing fibroid does is it distorts the uterine um, anatomy. So usually when you, you people come to the women come to the hospital with uterine fibroids, you realize that even when you are palpating to estimate the uterine size from the abdominal estimations, the uterus hardly has a uniform shape. It's always like has an uneven, there's serious asymmetry when it comes to uterine fiber because it's really distorts the uterine shape, so uterine anatomy. So in that, with that light, we need to know, like they told us, what are your symptoms? What symptoms do you have? If you don't have any symptoms, you don't have IDA, um, you don't have any, challenges with the menses, you don't have heavy menstrual bleeding, um, it's not in locations that is affecting your chances of implantation, then you are good to go. For instance, if you have a fibroid located in the omentum or subserosa, it's not impacting on fertility. But any fibroid that finds find itself in the submucosa, because the um, fertilized ovum implant in the submucosa, I mean, submucosa layer, that's where implantation normally occurs, then we know that we are at risk of you having ectopic um, pregnancies because um, the fertilized woman cannot find a good spot to implant. So we we'll plant in a place that has less blood supply that's, um, and that cannot with, withstand the pressures that come with pregnancy and then you lose the pregnancy. So that's the difference. You need to know what symptoms you're having and how it's impacting you in your life before we can say that because you have fibroids, you're not, you're infertile. I've been in theater. I've seen people come with fibroids and they're like para three, para four. They still have children. It doesn't really impact on your chances of fertility if it's symptomless. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much, Doc, for the explanation. Please, the next one, please uh, come down to our understanding. Uh, so that you'll not be using, we don't understand uh, the para and the others. So it comes down to our understanding. Wait, what, what, level, what level of medical students am I dealing with? I'm thinking <laughs> it's after clinical year. That's why I'm using the word para. Um, um, I mean, our guests here, majority are, are, are not on the medical field. So when you use the terms. Right. Okay. Yeah. So it is not me right So when now. I talk about parity, parity is the number of children a person has given birth to whether like alive, whether I gave birth to them alive and then they are still alive, or I gave birth to them and then they died along the process. So when I say someone is para four, it means that the person probably has four children, or the person has been able to give birth to four children. That's it. Sorry about that. I should have asked about your audience first. Yeah. All right. Thank you so much for doing justice to that, Dr. Eva Ferra. Um before I bring out the next question, uh, please, we want to move to our audience. It, it seems if you don't call them, they won't talk. So I'm trying to call people. Wow, so we have um, a board member of BRW joining us, uh, Ms. Esther Afri. Ms. Esther Afri, please, um, do you have any question concerning what we learned today? Okay, thank you. Um, I don't really have a question. It's not really major, but then um, Dr. Fade was talking about like sports. If you have sports, it can be a sign that you're going to have a, a difficult fibroid. But is it always when you have a sport, then it's a process of you getting a fibroid or sometimes um, depending on, it said depending on, on your age, your menstrual cycle will change or whatever. So does it also um, really count to you? Maybe you have any sporting or it's just a sign of you getting fibroid, that is all. Thank you. Okay, you're welcome, Esther. So sporting is not supposed to be a natural occurrence in a woman's menstrual cycle. Now, if you are sporting, I'd like to know your last menstrual period or the last time you had your menses. Could it be because you had a pregnancy that you are losing 
for which reason you are spotting, for which reason we need to do further investigation. Could it be that you are having um, a polyp or that's like um, a fleshy mass either in your um, mutual that's protruding out or just around your vaginal area that is causing you to have spotting? Could it be that it's actually a fibroid in there that is also leading to the spotting because some could have the intermenstrual bleeding? Or could it be that you have some sexually transmitted diseases, for instance, cervicitis, that's inflammation of the cervix, or vaginitis, that occasionally will come with some bleeding? Or could it even be that you actually have, um, let's say it's um, early stages of cervical cancer, for which reason you are spotting? So spotting has along in a woman's um, um, reproductive system could be due to so many things. It could not just be a fibroid that is causing you to spot. It could be you losing the pregnancy. It could be a fibroid. It could be um, any beginning of cervical cancer, like the early stages. It could be a, um, a cervical um, yeah, infection, cervicitis, or it could just be um, a vaginal infection that has oscillated the uterine and the vaginal walls that's causing you to bleed in between the periods. So like she said, some of these things, we need to take your history, we need to examine and then do further investigation to find out why you are coming in with this kind of symptom. Please, I hope this is clear. Yes, it is. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you so much, Dr. Eva Vera. Uh, let me see who again, who again. Okay. Um, Okay, so we have another guest joining us, uh, Miss Rhoda, joining us all the way from China. Thank you so much. Those joining us from China, it is 2 a.m. and you are still awake to support. God bless you. Uh, please, do you have any question concerning uh, uterine fibroid? Do you have any question, uh, Miss Rhoda? Uh, please, can you hear me? Your mic is muted. Okay, um, so let's continue. Another uh, question is that this question is coming from me, please, Dr. Iba Vera. Now, can you use local treatment? I mean, local medicine that we call in Ghana, we call, sorry for our, our foreigners, in Ghana, we say Abibidro. Uh, I don't know in other nationals how you call it, but I think that's local medication. I think that's understandable. So uh, the, our herbal uh, medicine, is it advisable to use herbal medicine when you are being diagnosed? Because most women go for scan or when they go to hospital and due to the symptoms, the doctor has for scanning, they find out they have had uterine fibroid and they are being told. Now they've turned out to looking for a uh, herbal medication because they've heard the herbalists talking about it and people giving a uh, testimony about it. So they go for it. Is it advisable for women to take it because uh, I'm an intent uh, medical student, and my my boss once told me that when they take the the that medication, it split the the fibroid or the myoma all over the womb. So I want to ask: Is it advisable for them to take it? Thank you. Okay, so before I move in to answer your question, there's whenever I get the opportunity to talk about these herbal alternative treatments to health diseases, there's one thing I always make people understand. Every medication we get are from herbs. The reason why we doctors feel comfortable to prescribe certain medications because we know the toxicity levels and we know the side effects. Now in our part of the world, um, our main reason for being against most of these herbal preparations is because we don't know that the toxicity levels in them. We don't know the preparations or the formulation that were used to make them. And then we don't know the side effect because we don't know which herbs they mix together to prepare the concussions you use for fibroids. Now, I've heard so many times, some women will say that, oh, I'm told when I take this herbal preparations, it will melt my fibroids. Brothers and sisters, no herbs melt fibroids. Even with the medication that we give, it doesn't melt fibroids. What they do is, so normally for both men and women, from the brain, like Faith said, the GNRH um, hormones, they flow in a pulsatal manner. When we say pulsatal, maybe every two to three hours, the hormones are released, the, the brain will release it. So when it releases it in that way, it regulates how much 
it's produced per time and then it allows the normal cycle of every woman or man to go through. Now, when we want to use medications to be the intervention to prevent or to um, treat fibroids, instead of giving the medications in a pulsatile manner, we give it in a continuous fashion. We should then um, desensitize the receptors that um, would, as opposed to receive the hormones that are produced from the brain. So that is in simple sense. That is how the medications we give for uterine fibroids work. Now, when I did OBGYN, I had some patients who would come in with various complications of using herbs. And the sad part of it is they use herbs, they place it in there, into the vagina, into the cervix, into the womb. What it does is that, yes, for some of them, for some strange things, and the bleed or the um, masses, the benign tumors would fall, some would fall out. But another thing it does is that it causes scarring. It can cause scarring of the vaginal walls and then you'd have um, a narrowed vaginal lumen, which can then lead to um, dyspareunia or you cannot even have sex with your partner again. Or for some of them, it causes infection due to how they insert things into the vagina, because generally the vagina is a very sterile area which takes care of itself. So when you keep on putting strange and foreign materials in there, you're increasing the chances of getting various vaginal infections. So in summary, herbs, no, it's a no-no for us. And when you start doing these herbs, I tell people always think about your kidneys because some of them are nephro or I'm not supposed to use that medical terms too much. Some of them can cause injury to your kidneys. And when you don't detect it early, you could end up with chronic kidney disease or your, your kidney could literally fail, which means you'd either need a kidney transplant or you'd have to be on a machine, which you call the dialyzing machine or dialyzer for the rest of your life. So that's just about it, please. All right. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Eva Vera, for doing justice to that. And I believe we've learned a lot today uh, as we are wrapping up, please, uh, do anyone have a question to ask before our uh, guest speakers run up for us? Please, any question? So before our guest speaker run up for us, please, um, for a special announcement. So this is going to continue. Uh, we are going to treat about four or three uh, health segments of BLW consistently every two weeks. We'll have it every two weeks. So our next uh, will be, is two. We'll, we'll think about it. I'll discuss with Dr. Iba Vera and uh, what will be favorable. So either survival cancer or uh, family planning. So we'll talk about that one uh, later. So when we decide, we'll let you know. So Dr. Eva Vera, please, um, can you wrap up for us? Thank you. Okay, thank you, William. So um, you show fibroids. Um, it's a benign um, mass usually found in the um, uterus of reproductive women. Um, usually when you are not in your reproductive years, that is pre or menarche, that before you start menses, or you are Postmenopausal, or you're, you're in a men uh, menopausal phase, you're not expected to have um, uterine fibroids. Now, and if you're in your menopausal stage and then you have um, a mass in your um, uterus, then we think more of endometrial cancer, which is more deadlier than uterine fibroids. Uterine fibroids are found only in reproductive women, and um, it's found more in Africans than the um, Europeans, the Americans, the Asians, and all that. Um, it causes severe distortion of the uterus, which should come with various symptoms. It can affect your fertility. It can lead to painful menses. It can lead to heavy bleeding. It can lead to anemia, iron deficiency anemia. It can lead to painful sex. Um, just in, in a short, um, picking out a few of them. But it's treatable. And treatment depends on your age, how many children you have, your fertility wishes, how badly it's affecting your quality of life, and what you yourself want as a patient, because we believe in autonomy of a patient. You have the right to decide the kind of treatment that you want. 
um, like my able Dr. Faith Bible said, don't Google your symptoms. It's better to talk to a doctor or a health practitioner to help you and guide you through to know the best management you need to employ for the condition. And yes, fibroid is treatable. It's not a life sentence. There are people who have fibroids and are still able to carry pregnancy to safety. And um, maybe some challenges that could come with having fibroid at certain locations, especially if it's found just where the just around the cervical opening, you may have to opt for surgery. And if you decided early, they could take out the fibroids during um, delivery of your baby. Yes, so those those are some of the few and uh, mishap that you could have when you have uterine fibers. But all in all, it's a benign tumor. It's treatable. Um, it doesn't really impact on your fertility wishes if it's symptomless. And uh, you can handle it if um, you um, seek early treatment. Um, let me just shift this in that because of the hormone that feeds uterine fibers, which is estrogen, and estrogen needs... Um, it's usually gotten from fat. Fibroid is also looking, um, it's usually seen in people who are obese because they have a lot of free adipose tissues or free fat cells working about the body, which the body can convert into estrogen and then feed the uterine fibers. So when you give the GnRH hormone antagonist or agonist, either one of them, what it seeks to do is that it seeks to prevent this um, episode where you can produce more estrogen to feed the uterine fibroid. Thank you. Sorry. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Um, so by the special grace of God, uh, the long awaiting program has finally come to an end. Before I call on... Uh, this is impromptu though, but sorry, before I call us, uh, Miss Esther free here to give us the closing remark of our meeting. Uh, please, I want to let you know that the meeting is recorded. It will be posted on all our social media handles, the Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. So you can share as well. When, when it's being posted, I will let you know. You can share as well. Please, I want to tell us to help. Let's support this uh, dream, BLW. It's, it's a very big dream by the grace of God. And today, everything big that we see today in the world started with a humble beginning. And believe you me, one day, one day, you will say that, hey, I was there when this started. And now this half of God has brought it. So please, let's support. When it, things are being posted there, let's support and share. And by the special grace of God, when it becomes big or ready to be harvested, you will see that, yes, indeed, you supported and it has yielded. Thank you so much. So we call on uh, Mrs. Stafia to give us a question remark together with the prayer as well. Thank you. Okay, thank, thank you so much for the opportunity. So we first of all, we have to thank God for such a wonderful day and also thank um, Dr. Faze and Dr. Eva Vera for a great delivery, and also the host, um, Dr. William. We are very grateful unto you, and not forgetting our audience. Thank you so much for the support and also cooperating with us. Um, let us all continue um, what Dr. William said. We should be supportive and also keep on believing that things will definitely go on well. So that is all. Thank you so much. Please, um, please let's pray. Our most high God, we thank you so much for a wonderful program. We are grateful unto you for this day. Thank you so much for the wisdom you've given unto our doctors and also for um for making it possible for us to join. We commit ourselves into your hands. We pray that God bless them with more knowledge, whatever program that they will put on board, let it be successful. We commit our audience into your hands, that you grant them the patience, you grant them the love, that they will continue to support this foundation. We pray that you, you, your, your mercies and your grace will be upon 
each and every one of us here. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 Thank you so much for coming, everyone. God bless you. Our guest speaker, Dr. Eva Veratetefio, Dr. Fit, Miss um, Estafri, uh, Miss Rhoda. Thank you so much. Uh, our guest, we came all the way from, uh, so join us all the way from China. It's 2 a.m. and you are awake to support. God bless you for joining. Thank you so much. Have a wonderful night, guys. God bless you. Thank you.